Hello, welcome. We are going to wait just a few more minutes, about two minutes to get started. And thank you for being here today. One more minute, and we want to welcome you to Tree Talk, and we'll be back in about one minute. Okay, well, thank you for being here today. This is the Metro Tree Advisory Committee's Tree Talk program that was started at the beginning of the COVID when we did so much outreach in the community and we thought this was a way to continue to do that outreach just um, by video, virtually. I am the host, I'm Jennifer Smith. I'm with the Metro Water Department as the horticulturalist. I work mainly on uh, urban forestry issues and I coordinate the Metro Tree Advisory Committee. And um, that, that is a great pleasure that I have in my life. And our guest today is Matthew Cunningham. He's a certified arborist with Arbor Art Tree Care. And Arbor Art Tree Care uh, has been a long member of the Metro Tree Advisory Committee. So it's great that you're here and welcome, Matthew. Thank you very much for having me. So Matthew's been in the green industry for 29 years. He, um, like myself, is a Nashville native um, and he specializes in diagnosing disease, insects, and cultural environmental issues on trees and landscape ornamentals. And I want to get in our presentation today, talk a little bit about the cultural environmental issues that you see when you're trying to diagnose something. I think that's a very fascinating approach um, to your work. But first, as we always like to do in tree talk is talk about your favorite tree and then I have my favorite tree. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the tulip poplar? Well, I love the tulip poplar, um, not just because it's the Tennessee state tree, but uh, I love its beautiful bloom that it puts off in the spring. Um, has a low disease and insect susceptibility. I really never have any problems out of them. They're fast growing trees uh, that uh, can uh, make a pretty quick impact. Um, uh, and um, you now just they have a really uh, neat leaf shape, a great shade trees. And I'll tell you another thing about tulip poplars that are great, especially for people who are are uh, trying to grow fescue in their lawn. They give great relief from uh, for cool season grasses in the summertime without creating an, an aggressive drip lawn. So that's an, another good, you know, for so they're pretty kind to the lawn as well. So we don't see the aggressive drip lines with, around tulip poplars that we see like around sugar maples and other and, and other trees. So I mean, they're just a, a really good, fast growing, beautiful blooming. Shade providing low disease and ex insect susceptibility tree. So, um, you know, kind of can't go wrong. Uh, all around winter. I don't know why this brought this back mm -hmm. to me, but when I was very young, I have a March birthday and all I asked for was tulips. That's all I wanted was tulips for my birthday. And my mother had a tulip tree planted for me. <laughs> and I remember going, <laughs> okay, but who knows? Maybe that got me off my path, um, my career path. So my favorite uh, tree is the bald cypress. I think it's just magnificent. It um, has the knees that if you're planted in a um, soggy area, so they can get the roots can come up and get the oxygen it's needed. The um, it is great, however, in yards and even street trees if you have the space um, in the right soil. But they can get tall, up to 70 feet tall. And some people have that space, some people do not. 
um, and they do enjoy the full sun. So they can take wet or dry conditions um, and withstand flooding. So you know, it's, it's great. The, the pictures of the needles here, um, it looks like it would be coarse, but it's not. It's very soft to the touch. And this is the kicker for me. It's a deciduous conifer. And that seems like an oxymoron, a deciduous conifer. And it has the needles, um, but it is deciduous and it loses the needles um, before winter, and you can see it's fall. Uh, it's kind of a rusty orange, beautiful color that um, welcomes in the fall season. So this is one of my my favorite uh, trees. I have several more, but this is the top of the list. So anyway, that's always a fun thing to do. And we're going to get right into um, what's happening in Nashville. We're going to talk about tree health, trees and construction, fall season and Nashville Trees Partners. So we have a lot of groups out there helping Nashville to um, maintain and enhance our urban forest. So we're gonna kind of go over what they do and how you can get involved. And of course, then questions. And if you have any questions, please um, just type them in your uh, box there. So Matthew, huh, the Emerald of Ash Borer. I will just say this before I turn it over to you that we have an estimated one 1.6 million ash trees. That's 1.6 million ash trees in Davidson County. And those are native trees. And unless they're treated, they will die. Matthew? Yes, it's the, uh, it, it was a, I started following this insect in 2011. Um, I believe it was first uh, discovered in Michigan in 1998, from what I understand. And, and, uh, uh, once it really, uh, they started catching them in pheromone traps around, I think, 2016, we, we started treating for them. And, and uh, you know, we were seeing this damage of this. Shelby, I went to Shelbyville and did a damage assessment uh, a few months ago. And and uh, I tell you, it's really bad. And it was a really um, eye-opening uh, thing, you know, to see uh, in what's to come in Middle Tennessee. And... Um, it, one interesting thing uh, I, I think uh, that about emerald ash borer is that the one of the few flat-headed borers, borers that will actually attack a healthy tree. They will attack a perfectly healthy tree. And I tell you, another thing, we've removed some uh, ash trees that seem to be perfectly healthy and only to process them on our property and find emerald ash borer larvae in them. So that so the the uh, when people looking at their trees, I, I think it's really important that it's that that we must assume that every ash tree in Middle Tennessee has at least been touched by it, and treating is is really important. On average, you can keep a tree treated for 20 years before you meet the estimated cost of removal. So there's also uh, a benefit, but. Uh, you know, economically to that, you know, in, on average in, in, in a lot of cases, and a lot of times removal depends on the access and, and all that kind of stuff. So it varies. Um, uh, well, the, the treatment, the treatment that you noted um, right now, the best way is that injection, you know, like shot, yes, ma'am, it shot, it, it's like shots right into the tree and you have yes, to do that every two years. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and that, but that is with the product imamectin benzoate has a residual of two years in the, in the tree. Other uh, systemic insecticides that are labeled for the control of emerald ash borer do not have that kind of residual, nor that it, do they have their percentage of, of efficacy. So right. uh, benzoate, um, you know, we're learning a lot from the folks up north that have, that have been through this. And, uh, and they've, I mean, it's been really bad up there. And, um, um, but, but that, that's the best thing that we have on the market right now for the control of Emerald Ash Borer, and it does offer two year control. So, and I, I, I want to also say about using soil drenches uh, for the control of, of Emerald Ash Borer, it is not as effective. Um, and also, there is, are a lot of studies on the effects of beneficial soil organisms in doing soil drenches with systemic insecticides. So we have to remember that there is a that there is an entire ecosystem within this critical root zone 
that these trees rely on for, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship in there. So when you're doing soil drenches with systemic insecticides, I think it's really important to take that into consideration. Well, I think it one of the um, options that a homeowner has is, to, even though they may think their tree is our, you know, perfectly healthy, is to go ahead and take it down before it gets so brittle, it it's more of a hazard to take down. Absolutely, um, um, it, 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 and it's less expensive to take it down when it's when it's alive. Uh, right. Trees, a, a lot of times we. Climbers do not like to climb dead trees, and so a lot of times, and especially the ash tree becomes especially brittle when it dies. And when you, uh, and, and so we have to have our special equipment to go in there and I mean, you almost have to whittle them down and, and even with, and so these, and some of these trees could be massive biostructures. I, um, I treated one. Uh, recently that was 70 inches in diameter at breast height. Wow. So that is one of the, the absolute largest single stem ash tree. Um, the International Society of Arboriculture gives uh, the ash tree a, um, a growth factor of four, which means that on average that tree grows one inch for every four years. So that would make that tree 280 years old. So these are the kind of biostructures that we're that we're talking about. And so when we and so when they're dead, they'll fall apart in our rigging. You know, when we're trying to rig them down safely, if you choose not to treat your ash trees, please remove them before they die. Or you definitely have to be able to get a bucket truck there. Let's just say it's on a slope, or right in, inside a fenced area, you you can't get that bucket truck. So it is a a management decision. You have to be very proactive in making. And there is this thing called the ash snap. So it can snap from the base and be very, very hazardous. So be proactive. And I've, and I've seen it. I've seen that, that the ash snap. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, scary to think that, you know, the kind of damage that can be done, you know, so. Right. Um, well, and um, so again, you can remove it even now if it's healthy. Um, you can treat it. And treatment, it's really not this time of year. When was the best time to treat the, the tree? Well, actually, because imamectin benzoate does have a two-year efficacy and we are treating them directly into the trunk, you can you can treat them this time of year. You can treat them. We're, we're treating uh, as soon as they come as soon, from bud break to defoliation. Because, and now they've come out with a higher percentage of active ingredient uh, of M of imamectin benzoate, which allows us to get the 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 uh, uh, same efficacy, but using less product. So even during periods of dormancy, the tree is still translocating just at a very very slow rate. So you can really treat at any time of the year, but uh, I, with the, with with the new technology, because it does have a two year efficacy. But we do absolutely recommend treating in periods where they when they are out of dormancy. Right, so next spring, the beginning of the spring, go ahead and schedule, because I've had my trees you know, treated and there's a long wait now. So what I've done is waited to the first of spring to get two growing seasons then, um, because the, the, right. the, you know, the activity going on during the winter is not great by the ash borer. So I think, you prolong Absolutely. two years, so that would be what yeah. I was referring to. But you can uh -huh. also, right. if if your tree can fall in any direction and not hit a target like a car, a house, a playground, then letting it fall over, it will biodegrade as well, right? Sure, sure. And I think that's in um, that is. I, I like that you said that. You know uh, about the insect activity in the winter. The boards, uh, the larva is still feeding in the winter, uh, although that is um, uh, they are not as active because of the cooler temperatures, which brings us to climate change. You know, as our as our um, uh, climate warms and our winters are not as cold, they just are not. We are getting disease, heavier disease and insect pressures even during the winter, especially mites. We're seeing bad mite problems, bad southern red mite problems on laurels. Not to get off the emerald ash borer topic, because emerald ash borer is the heaviest thing going on in our industry right now. For right. sure. Right. 
I know years ago when um, I knew it was coming to Tennessee, I talked to people I work with that are in Ohio and Michigan, and they said, Jennifer, this will be the biggest issue you will deal with in your professional career. And you think about it, we're doing, inven we're doing inventories or street trees and in our parks, and it's we have a lot of ash trees uh, naturalized, especially in our parks. And um, it's, oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a big deal. Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. Um, it, you know, and it's a, uh, uh, you know, I have a, a customer who has twenty seven ash trees on his manicured property, and all of them are over twenty five inches in diameter, and his estimated cost of removal is over one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So we have, you know, that's the economic, the economic impact is going to be in the billions. Okay? It's just going to be, there's going to be a lot of it. We're in an ash belt; they're everywhere in Nashville. So. Well, and, and people can work on their budget. For, for, for instance, you can say, well, I'm going to treat so many ash trees and my budget will allow me to take down so many this year. And you do that for several years and that does help. It doesn't solve sure. the issue, but it helps. Okay. Sure. And, and also treating your trees helps to reduce the holding capacity of the insect itself. Although they'll be here probably for the rest of our lives. But, you know, every time an uh, emerald ash borer adult goes and bites the leaf uh, before it does its, as it does its maturation feeding to condition its eggs to feed on that tree, it will kill the adult. Um, okay. One, now, one, oh, I'm ahead. sorry, go ahead. Well, okay, I could move... go on forever about this, you know. Oh, I, so. Yes, <laughs> um, I could talk about it in my sleep, I think, because it's such an important <laughs> right. issue right now. But this is another um question that I get about the crepe myrtle uh, bark scale. So crepe myrtles are such a popular tree in our community. And um, by and large, they're very hardy, unless we get really, really cold temperatures. But this is what's being seen. It sure is. Uh, seen, especially in Franklin, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the West Haven subdivision is probably the highest concentration of crepe myrtle bark cell that I've seen in Middle Tennessee is in West Haven. I mean, I'm there was a top period that I was going out there three days a week di diagnosing this. So um, uh, uh, one thing about this insect that is concerning is it creates a necessity for the use of neonicotinoids, and that which is systemic insecticides, and. We are all concerned about the bees, and we're all under, and we're all aware of what how attractive crepe myrtles are to pollinators. And uh, you know, the question is, are we going to stop discouraging the planting of crepe myrtles because this is really very, very prolific insect? So this is first, uh, I believe, first discovered in Texas in 2004. Um, uh, I first saw it a couple of years ago uh, in Murfreesboro. It's just some isolated cases, and then last year started started seeing it very, very heavily in Franklin. So, um, um, and Nashville, Nashville, we are working to become a B city USA. So there's going to be concern and consideration for the B population. But what do you? Absolutely. What are some of the signs here that you see? So no, well, the one, have this. Well, the first thing that most people notice, because most people, as they're walking by the trees, don't necessarily inspect them, you'll start to see your branches start to turn black uh, because they are plant juice suckers and, and, they're, and they're heavy honeydew producers. And what that black is, is black sooty mold that grows on the honeydew that the that the scale insect is producing. Now, now crepe myrtle aphid, which is also a really common pest of crepe myrtle, also produces that honeydew and can turn your crepe myrtle black, but it's nothing like the way crepe myrtle bark scale does. Okay, and, and so it'll look like little pieces of, of, of cotton all over your branches. And so, uh, and then you can go in and squish one and it'll have this pink colored blood, right? And uh, and that's important to note because when we're when you treat them, you may you may kill them, but they don't always fall off the tree. So if you so before you determine whether or not your your uh, your 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 the app, your insecticide application has worked, go ahead and give them a smush and see if you see that pink blood. If you don't see the pink blood, your 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 uh, insecticide application has worked. Well, what is the timeline for the treatment? Well, you can do we. 
like to treat at bud break uh, uh, when we're doing soil applications, um, trunk applications on um, crepe myrtles. You know, we a lot of times we try to avoid drilling into a tree annually, so we like to get the tree to recover. Um, but uh, you would want to do that bud break as they, as they start to leaf out in the spring. Go ahead and do your um, uh, uh, soil drench with your systemic insecticide. Usually, it's a metoclopred that people are using or donor to fear on. So safari or merit. Very They're popular. Yeah, very Lots popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Any thought on the pruning time, best pruning time for crepe myrtles? Well, um, we always prune crepe myrtles. Of course, you know, you can raise the canopies at any time. Uh, uh, more cons uh, pruning time, you know, after they bloom, we always prune prune them after they defoliate and let all that stuff run back down into the root zone. And but the biggest concern and the number one offender on crepe myrtles is actually how they're pruned. And these right. you know, everybody's heard of crepe murder. These people who are cutting off, uh, you know, half the tree, and uh, and because they're someone has told them that it makes them bloom better. Well, you know what it does, but but that that. Uh, uh, more blooms is actually a stress response from a cultural issue uh, that that's been created as a result of over pruning. So, you know, selectively pruning off the house, um, getting your uh, uh, pruning off the expired buds, you know, just a little, you know, 10, 15% reduction around the around, uh, off the tip of the crown and limb it up and make it look nice, cut off some cross crossing branches. And we usually, we usually we do that during dormancy. Okay. Um, next, something uh, very sad to see. Um, it seems like it's getting, I see it more and more. It's a bacterial leaf scorch. Yes, our pin oaks are getting hammered by this. And it's really showing up right now this time of year. I'm getting probably, I could be getting four or five calls on this a week. This bacterial leaf scorch is a bacterial disease that clogs up the vessels in the xylem layer of the tree. Uh, causing a water nutrient restriction. Um, it, 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 it slows translocation of water nutrients from the root system to the ground. And you'll usually see it, uh, you can see the pictures are pretty, pretty telltale. Um, you'll see the margins around the leaves. And, um, and, and we've seen this on pin oaks. Uh, that's usually what it is. And this, this disease is transmitted by a leaf hopper. That's a vector of this disease. And so they'll just go from, you know, thing to thing, from tree to tree and, and just spreading this stuff. And I'll tell you, sycamores are getting hit by it too, which is uh, um, a uh, really sad because it's actually my second favorite tree. <laughs> of so, course. So just diagnosed bacterial leaf scorch on a sycamore yesterday again. So if you guys, you guys driving around town, you're seeing these dead trees and you see a white tree that has exfoliating bark. It's probably, it's, it's, it's a, probably a sycamore and it probably died of bacterial leaf scorch. We're seeing a lot of it around town. We had a street in downtown that was, um, had them on both sides and they had the leaf scorch and they just kept, dying a little bit at a time and they lasted for a few years, but it was hard to see them through this process. Um, right. They wouldn't die completely, but they got weakened every year until they had to be cut down. Right, right. And you'll see a gradual crown decline every year. The uh, There is no cure for this disease, but we can manage th this disease. And what we recommend, you'll have to do annual injections of um, of uh, uh, antibiotic, we use OD tetracycline for this, uh, and we uh, and we use it in combination with a growth regulator. Um, I like growth regulators. They are what a growth regulator does. On the we use um, uh, the uh, paclobutrazol uh, growth regulator uh, for these and. And it slows the growth. It, it, it suppresses the gibberellin hormone that's responsible for the shoot growth of the tree. And in, in turn, it causes the tree to redirect its energy into building a stronger cell wall structure, which can make can will make a tree more disease resistant. So on top of so it's a really good uh, combo thing to do in when you're um, uh, combating 
bacterial leaf score to create that resistance and to suppress the disease development with the odor tetracycline. That's that's interesting as a way to manage your trees. Yeah, it really is. Um, um, it, it's uh, and we see it. Um, you know, we we do disease management. You know, through growth regulators, and we also are recommending it for Leland Cypress for the uh, to create resistance to ceridium canker as well. What other uses do you use it for? Well, it reduces pruning. Which saves you money, right? Right. Um, uh, it, it really to reduce pruning and for disease resistance is what is really what we use it for. So, That's and it also in areas where, as we all know, it it reduces their water requirements. And so, everyone knows the faster a tree grows, the greater its water and nutrient requirements. So it, when you slow that tree down, you actually create better drought resistance. So that's another thing to consider while, while someone would consider a growth regulator. That's fascinating. So again, the oaks, sycamores, elms, sweet gums, plane trees, all these are uh, susceptible to this and it does spread and it's yeah. disheartening. It is, it is, and, but, we, but, but I think maybe because of the, the faster growth rates of the, uh, um, of the uh, pin oaks and the sycamores, I think that that's why we're seeing a greater reaction to this. I see. And just like, yeah, and so it, it, it we, and this is one thing that we, that's really important to note it, when we're, we're doing disease in disease management, is that every once in a while you'll see the fruiting bodies of, of a disease like with powdery mildew and some rust diseases and things of that nature. But most of the time we're not seeing the disease at all. We're seeing the reaction of the plant to the disease. And so when the when when and a lot of times that reaction is exacerbated by when your cultural and environmental house isn't in order. So um, and so when we see like like for instance. Um, dogwood planted in planted too deep in full sun. You know we're going to get an exaggerated reaction to dogwood anthracnose. You know from uh, as a result of those uh, um, uh, cultural environmental issues. So, it, uh, so it's real important in disease management, and it's the it's the beginning of an of integrated pest management to make sure that your cultural house is in order and your environmental house is in order, and and that's with all your plants. They they don't put those, you know, sunlight requirements and planting requirements on those tags for their amusement. <laughs> you know, they're they're, they're intended to be well, followed. So. I think what we've we learned here too with the ash and uh, responses to the bacterial leaf scorches to plant a variety of trees um, so sure. that whatever disease or insect that's out there, um, you won't kill off the whole type of tree. If you've planted right. just that one tree in your yard or in the street, so we're all learning from that. Sure, um, sure. And now this is, yeah, we certainly okay. discourage monocultures in the landscape, uh, especially yes. with our trees. Definitely. Yes. Now this is an issue um, that we see more and more as our city continues to grow and develop, and we are conscious that we're losing our tree canopy because of all this, and we have um, codes. We have. Uh, tree policies that we're trying to strengthen as well to protect our, our trees and our heritage trees. Um, but this is a big, big issue. And I think sometimes, you know, there's, you mentioned earlier, a, a tree that's planted too deep. Well, if people just understand that roots breathe and if you plant them too deep, they're not gonna be up close to the top where the oxygen is. And so, you know, what is it about the critical root zone and all those things that if you take care of those during construction, then you can save that tree. If you don't take care of it, the tree's gonna die no matter what. And you've mentioned this as a subject. I like your picture between 2011 and 20. That's a telltale sign there. Wow. Yeah. It's not the town we grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's uh, 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 definitely, uh, it's booming. It's certainly not the city I remember as a four-year-old. I remember the LNC Tower and that's about it. Okay, but, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, 
planning, I think one big thing, and, and another thing about planning depth, it, that um, a lot of landscapers don't realize, especially in bald and burlapped uh, trees, is that when these things are dug from the field, when they are dug, usually dug with spades, and they're lifted up out of the ground, and a layer of soil will will will, will be over the trunk flare the majority of the time, and that needs to be removed. You, when you have a when you plant a tree, you should see exposed trunk flare on on uh, above the ground, because what happens when you when you don't is that that tree can develop a girdling root and cause a water nutrient restriction that way. We actually, we, we see this so often that we actually have a service uh, it, it, that's an, it's literally an air knife where we have to take compressed air and expose the root zone and prune out the girdling roots on trees. And this doesn't happen in five or six years. This happens in 10 years. All of a sudden your tree, your tree looks fine and all of a sudden it starts to gradually go into decline as a result of a girdling root causing a water and nutrient restriction. So it's really important not to mulch over your trunk flares, not to grade over your trunk flares. We should see exposed trunk flare when we see a tree and also remove the cages. And another thing is when you are digging a standalone hole, Okay, in these in, in, in these uh, uh, in, in when you when you plant a tree, you're digging one hole. You should backfill with the ambient soil, what that tree is going to spend the rest of its life with. And, be, and we see a lot of times when these people, especially in new construction, where they are adding um, uh, soil amendments to their backfill, they're actually creating more pore space in the critical root zone than what is around, than, than, what, than the ambient soil. And these roots will follow the path of leaf resistance. And it can also cause your tree to hold water in the critical root zone. So a lot of people, we used to think if you put gravel or something in the hole that it would keep your tree from holding, it actually causes it to hold more water. Because it and we call that the bathtub effect. The bathtub effect, exactly, exactly. So, and these trees hold water, and then all of a sudden the fungal lesions develop on the root system, causing a water nutrient restriction. People think that it's not getting enough water, and then they go out there and water it, and it's just creating more and more problems. So, backfill with the ambient soil. Don't grade above the trunk flare. Put a layer of mulch around the tree. Uh, don't mulch all the trunk flare, and and that'll help you know hold moisture and protect the tree from mowing equipment. And I will say um, in our codes, our tree ordinance, that for a new home or a, a house that's being significantly added onto, that that comes into the code or new new house, um, that for every 30 feet of frontage, you have to plant one two inch caliber tree about six feet tall to meet code. And so you will see that going on throughout the city in these new new homes. Right. So that's that's important. Okay. Right. And be careful about planting trees in the summertime, especially maples. We are seeing uh, flat-headed metallic applewood borer all over the place, and they're really attacking newly planted maples that are planted in the late spring and summer. So okay. uh, it's always it's always best to plant when disease and insect pressures are low. And their bark is so thin. I'm sure they're the target. Uh, they he always said it would be on the on that on that west side where that gets its sunburn and and that adult will lay the egg right on top of that hot spot. So um, pre-site construction plans are so critical if you're going to save the tree. Sure. Sure. And what happens is that we see a lot, of course, grading over the trunk flare again. Uh, you know, and we need to have heavy equipment uh, running all over the road side all over the critical root zone. So we want to make sure that we're getting about a foot and a half of radius. Um, uh, we will put up this, the orange fencing around right. the tree, you know, around Correct. the critical root zone. You want a foot and about a foot and a half per inch of diameter of breast height, a foot and a half radius per inch of diameter of breast height, right? So if you have a one inch tree, you want a foot and a half of, of radius around it and so on and so on. So, uh, and, uh, and just try to keep people out of it. It's a very, very right. important thing. Well, you know, the 
people who are building, they want to park under the shade of the tree and it's compressing the soil. Well, it's not That's like right. a sponge. Once it's compressed, it doesn't pop back up. And all those little micro holes for the oxygen and water right. get get pushed together. Okay. And that just starts the death of that tree. It may take a while, but it's it starts it. Yeah. And even crush roots. You know, even crushed right. roots causing water nutrient restriction in that matter. You know, it, it, it compromises your water nutrient availability and it creates a water nutrient restriction. So you get kind of getting a double whammy. And as that tree it, uh, stresses as a result of that, makes it attractive, makes it attractive to uh, boring insects and you will get an exaggerated reaction to any disease that, that it may incur. So um, it's real important. They to, know to the they know the tree's under stress, so they go attack it. Yeah. Right, right. And it actually puts out a pheromone. Because, yes. you know, as we were talking about the emerald ash borer being one of the only flat headed borers that will attack a perfectly healthy tree. Well, construction trees are, are, are the trees that the other borers would like to like to feed on because it does create uh, uh, less sap being translocated through the xylem because healthy sap can kill most boring insects. And they will, and, and it gives them an opportunity to feed because they like that cellulose on that uh, uh, in in the wood in there. So, but that healthy sap can actually kill most flat-headed borers and, and ran, even round-headed borers. So they'll, and, and that's when they attack it. Is when that's so, when, when the tree is under stress. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Okay, now fall season is upon us, and we are hopefully going to have a beautiful fall color this year. Um, but we were talking about how the deciduous and the evergreen differ and what happens to them this fall. Well, um, the biggest thing that I get calls on um, are people are concerned about their conifers. Uh, uh, it, it, do in the fall as they're due their seasonal interior needle cast. That is the biggest thing you'll see it a lot in Leland Cypress. You also see it in the spring. Um, uh, as they're flushing out new growth, they'll usually do a heavy interior needle cast twice a year. And we see it in arborvitas, um, just about, you know, arborvitas, pine, all of our conifers. As they're flushing out new growth on the ends, they will cast their interior needles on the inside. And I bet I get a call on it every single day during the spring, during the, during the, when, it, when these trees are really, really flushing out. We got to remember that tree is the most efficient living organism in the world. Nothing grows larger, lives longer, all while making its own food. And part of that efficiency is casting those needles that aren't gathering enough sunlight to support themselves. So we're going to see that uh, in the in, in the fall and spring. So expect a uh, uh, and as with, with as much rain as we've had this year, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of growth. Uh, uh, on these trees, so we could probably expect a very heavy seasonal interior needle cast this fall as the days get shorter, things start to get cooler. They're going to cast those needles on the inside. That's the biggest thing that I get on. And of course, your deciduous hardwoods, you're going to see, uh, um, uh, you know, the normal dechlorification of the uh, uh, of the trees in the leaves as they as the abscission cells, you know, as their days get shorter, and then they'll eventually cut the energy off to the leaf and they'll end up dropping them. So hopefully with all the rain, we got sugar maple is going to be awesome this year. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite, of course. And, 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 yeah, and sweet gums too. Sweet gums get really pretty. And, and the dogwoods, of course. So a little bit about what the tree does as it prepares for winter and the need for fall fertilization. Well, as this trends, as these days get shorter and things get a little cooler, um, the uh, uh, the tree isn't benefiting as much from having those those leaves. So the abscission cells will start to cut off energy to those leaves, and, the, and what we're seeing is just a normal dechlorification as a result of that. So it's translocating that energy back down into the critical root zone, and this is a great time for it to fertilize in the fall and uh, to replenish the soil. And I like deep root fertilization, especially in manicured lawns where the um, we're, we're mowing around the trees and all that and creating soil compaction as deep root fertilization. When you get down in there, you squeeze that thing. It helps aerate the soil as well while 
providing nutrients to replenishing the nutrients to the tree because these trees are competing for the nutrients with grass, which is a super fast growing, you know, high water nutrient requirement plant. Right? How, how deep? So, how deep do you fertilize? We go about two feet. Two feet. So, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're eighteen inches. Right. Eight, you know, well, that does, 18 inches, two feet. Yeah, that really yeah. would help with the compaction. That's a good oh, thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, and we, we put that probe in the ground and we, you squeeze that handle. It's a, it's a jet coming out of there. So we were talking about five gallons a minute that 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 water's coming out. So that's a that's pretty good. Pretty, pretty good volume, pretty good thrust. So it does do a lot to aerate the soil. OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about our organizations in Nashville that are helping to sustain and enhance our tree canopy. And just briefly, I'm going to run through these. The Metro Tree Advisory Committee was started in 1984, and they do a lot of different events throughout the year to educate our citizens. Um, they um, host the Tree City USA. You might see those signs across the city. We've been a tree city uh, for 26 years. We do the Arbor Day with the mayor each year, the Lawn and Garden Show, come by our booth. We are the ones that give away the tree seedlings. We started a tree nursery with the sheriff's office. Um, we have our recommended tree list, and um, we work under the Metro Beautification Environment Commission. So um, that's another Metro organization, and so the tree advisory is, is under that. Um, Root Nashville. The Root Nashville is a, a citywide campaign to plant a half a million trees by 2050. And we need it as we are seeing all the trees coming down through disease and death and just construction. So um, they have a program for neighborhood planting captain, captains that volunteers um, can sign up to be for their neighborhood. It's, it's a fun job. And what is really important, you know, we're out there, Metro's out there planting. But Metro has less than 5% of the property in our county. So we need you to plant and spread the word to your neighbors to plant in their yards as well. And then be sure to go to the um, Root Nashville tree plotter and you can plot your tree on it so it can count towards this goal. And currently we're a little over um, 19,500 um, trees that have been plotted there. So that's kind of fun to look. And I do want to note that all these tree organizations really, really, really stepped up to help replenish our tree canopy after the tornado last spring. It was very devastating for our canopy. The Nashville Tree Foundation, you can see that was uh, started in 1986. They do a lot of things um, throughout the year. One of their, their annual events is Relief Nashville, which is always a Saturday before Thanksgiving and a lot of fun. They have um, the green shirt program, which trains volunteers up to be uh, leaders on planting days. So much of their planting is done by volunteers, um, and that's a fun, fun event. You learn a lot and, and really feel good about what you're giving back to the community. They're starting their tree planting season now, and you can go to their website and learn how you can get involved. Their Nashville Tree Fest is also starting where they're giving away trees at farmers markets throughout the city. And another program they do is the big old tree contest that um, notes the largest trees in our in our county. So that's a whole list, hundreds of those trees that you can go and and look at. Another group out there working for us is the Nashville Tree Conservation Corps. They uh, began their start in 2015, and they really focus on tree policy and helping us strengthen our tree ordinances. Um, that are then um, come out of our codes department. So um, they've been on the, the boots on the ground in that area. But one a particular project, uh, something they started last year, is the Shelby Street Arboretum. And we planted through a couple of weekends with a lot of volunteers, over 560 trees. And they're working to become an arboretum, which is a place for education and outreach. And also, uh, started was the Shelby Street tree stewards. So if you live in that area and want to become a tree steward, um, get in touch with them. It's it's gonna it's a fun group of neighbors that care about the trees. And then I really want to give a plug to the uh, tree sale they host farm to to yard. 
and they have 56 trees offered this year. There's beautiful pictures on their website, so you can dream about what you want to plant this, this growing season, and they have little information about the trees too. They get delivered directly from the nursery to your yard. You can plant it or you can pay a up fee to have it planted your, uh, as well. And all those trees are plotted for the Nashville uh, campaign, the Root Nashville campaign again to plant a half a million trees by 2050. So those are um, some groups that are here locally in Nashville. The Tennessee Urban Forestry Council, that's the organization statewide that uh, sponsors the Arboretum Certification Program. You can see the four levels and it's a three-year certification. And for you homeowners, they have a tree sanctuary pro a program for just the individual home. And that's a nice um, designation. You have to have 10 tree species identified there. And I just want to give a shout out. I was their director for, for many, many years, and I learned so much traveling the state, working with cities of, of the largest to the smallest cities. And I feel like I gained a lot of urban forestry knowledge that I've, I've been able to bring back to my position here in Metro, which I've had for about nine years. Um, and then we also have the Tennessee Environmental Council and they are doing great jobs. They were they were um, started in 1970, and they really got behind the movement to plant trees, realizing all the environmental benefits that trees provide. Um, so they have a, a million native trees by 2025, and you, they've been planting seedlings in all 95 counties through this um, Tennessee Tree Day, and it's already uh, since 2007 they've planted. Um, close to um, 741, 960 trees. Uh, again, they're seedlings and their tree day for this year or for 2022 is March 19th. So reservations will start in November for those. And again, this is a statewide distribution of tree seedlings. Um, again, we're just losing our tree canopy to so many things. And so this is just one more uh, way, uh, another tool, if you will, to um, help with that, because trees do help us with stormwater mitigation, air quality, and of course, they're beautiful. So I just want to encourage you to get involved. Um, There's so many ways to plug in as a tree captain for the tr uh, Root Nashville to be a volunteer tree planter. It's a lot of fun. Um, we're out there on the weekends and we, we have you know, fellowship or fun, we go to lunch, we get to know each other and, and we are weekend warriors when we're out there planting trees. And um, Matthew is so right, you know, the green shirt program is so important because it's not that you plant trees, but you plant them correctly. So the green shirts help to make sure that the, what I call done in a day volunteers come in, that they get, get that and they don't plant the tree so deeply so the roots can breathe. But at any rate, um, I'm, Ready, um, Matthew and I are ready to take any questions that you might have about trees, tree care, and what's going on um, in Nashville. Anything we can help to promote? I'm not sure if there's any questions um, or not. So I'm going to ask Sade if if there are any. Which would be unusual. Oops. Okay, well, let's see what our timing. It's it's just about time to close up, but um, I'm going to get back and then I'm going to turn it back over to Matthew to say any other closing comments and and um, environmental um, ways that you that help you make your you know decisions on what's wrong with the tree. But again, I just want to encourage everyone this growing season to <sighs> plant a tree in your yard. Um, and plot it on the Root Nashville website so it can count towards our goal, our citywide goal, to plant a half a million trees by 2050. And if you have not already, please go to your yard, in your yard, and look up. You can um, identify ash trees in your yard and see, and, and if you haven't already, this is a this is a big deal. This is an epidemic in our city, and we need you to 
Um, go ahead, identify trees, tell your neighbors that this is a big deal. Um, I have a, a um, neighbor and, and I shared a, a ash tree on our boundary between half and two yards. And, and anytime you have a tree that sits, it can be 50, 50 or 20, 80. State law says that both you come together and make decisions about the health and well-being of that tree. So we came together and um, both put in funds to have that tree treated. So that's one way of, of doing that. But Matthew, any other closing marks about what's going on in this fall and how you make your, your diagnosis? Um, well, hey, Jennifer, uh, I, just, I just want to interrupt for just a second. Jennifer, we do have a few questions. Um, but like you said, we are coming to a close. Um, so well, what I can do is I can send you those questions if you want to uh, let's, email those. I, I'm not able to see them. So if you have them, that would be great. And you could read them out. Okay. Um, we have a few of them. Just until we our time runs out. Um, so Lori Lazo says, I have a tree with gray powder on it. Should I be concerned? It's a crepe myrtle. Gray powder is probably powdery mildew. Uh, we're seeing that a lot. Um, it can be controlled uh, with several different fungicides that uh, control that. Um, uh, we use chlorothalonil a lot for that. Uh, it can be, I wouldn't be concerned about it right now at this time of year because we're about to. Um, you know, they're going to go into dormancy, but um, powdery mildew has been an issue this year because it's been so humid for sure. But your most fungicides will control powdery mildew. Just check out the label. That's what it sounds like to me is powdery mildew. Okay, next question. We have a question from Joanna. Um, is there anything we can do when we see commercial or residential redevelopment where there are mature trees on site with no protections from bulldozers and it's is there a place to report this so that maybe the contractor builder can quickly remedy? Well, there's no city code right now to help with that. And so, um, you know, just as an individual citizen, if you feel comfortable just noting that to them and, um, you know, what's a process to save that tree? Because if they don't, that critical root zone, it may take three, five years, but that tree is going to start to fail and die. And then there's a big cost to take that tree down. So um, it's, it's an educational process, but it's not oh. yet in our, in our codes. And Wayne says, I would like to ask about enacting codes within Metro to protect our trees. Right. Well, we're, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the National Tree Conservation Corps really um, has a lot of effort to work on tree codes to protect our iconic trees, um, slopes, and everything in, in that. But it's it's a process, and every you know, it's a lot of of getting a lot of people involved to get these um, codes written, sponsored, and then they go through three readings of Metro Council to approve each time. So it's a slow process, but we're working on it. And I, we feel very strongly that this is an important step to our sustainable urban forestry camp campus canopy. And John has a two part question. Are there noticeable signs slash symptoms of emerald ash borer infestation on an ash or other tree? Are other trees susceptible? No, um, emerald ash borer is host specific. They only eat ash trees. Uh, um, their the, uh, tree can be infested without showing any visible signs. Usually, there is a delay in the in the crown decline uh, uh, from when the injury actually occurs. So, um, but we have to assume that every ash tree has at least been touched by emerald ash borer at this point, and and, and definitely have it treated. And if you peel out the bark and you see these serpentine channels in the tissue, that's the larvae that's eating that tissue. Right. That's and you'll why, see, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll see. And you'll see around town, you'll see the uh, look up in, in the canopy 
that's what emerald ash borer causes the water nutrient restriction as it feeds in the xylem layer, which is the the, the layer of the tree which which is responsible for water upper water nutrient translocation. So, so you'll see the dead branches in the crown, and uh, and that's what it looks like. Um, uh, if you ever go to Shelbyville, <laughs> you'll see what emerald ash borer looks like. That's so, for sure. Uh, <laughs> next question. Michael asks, when does it become detrimental to the environment to continue using chemicals to treat a tree? Well, because we do a tree injection, uh, uh, in, it, that's a good question. Because we do a tree injection directly into the tree, there is no risk of exposure to any other, uh, to, to the surrounding. It will only um, uh, affect the insects that are actually feeding on the tree on the emerald ash borer. Now, there's a good point to be made in regards to uh, other things as far as, uh, you know, like when we were talking about um, uh, crane water bark scale use, using neonicotinoids and their effect on the pollinators, uh, I, it, it's my opinion to stop recommending the planting of grape myrtles, in my opinion. So it, it all depends. And I think I get this question a lot. Um, because when you do those injections, it kills the ash borer and everything else in that tree. So there's that argument that tree, um, they're wind pollinated and usually the little, little bit of bitty flowers that the ash trees have come out before the bees do. But there's also argument to say, well, that, that standing tree is doing so much to mediate stormwater and helping with our air quality. Um, still home to squirrels and other wildlife. So I think um, you've got to weigh all the benefits. Absolutely. And uh, I think that also when, when these voids get created in our canopies, uh, you know, as much as we see these introduced disease and insects uh, uh, tearing a forest up, really our biggest pest is still exotic plants. And uh, because they're they indiscriminately indiscriminately killed, they are not host specific, you know. So um, that's that's a big thing, and we could lose our, um, you know. Uh, there's some things coming down the pike that, uh, I mean, I could go on for weeks. So we have to save that for another tree talk. So one let, and I oh. and I want to just mention the thing too. That's a good point that Matthew made. In the woods, when these trees fall down, there's going to be new sunlight. And so will a native plant get there first or will the invasive Alanthus and others get there? And it can, can change our whole dynamic of our, our natural woods. So absolutely. I and mean, Alanthus is a, a particular concern, but we don't want to get into that. So yes. okay, our last question. HL asks, who do we call if my pin oak has the leaf scorch? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I, I will say that um, that's either we, you call a professional arborist um, or, you know, UT Extension. You could go to their, their website and look at pictures and stuff to help diagnose it. The city, we don't go on in general to private properties and make diagnosis. I get asked that quite a bit. Yeah, we, we um, it, you have to be licensed to treat for it. That's one thing that, so we do treat for it. Um, I don't want to use this form to advertise, but, um, uh, but you know, just make sure that whoever you use is, uh, is not only a certified arborist, but is an HLT as well. So that's what, that, that's what we specialize in. You have that um, licensing by the state to yes, swap the yes. chemicals. And you can go to the American, I mean, to the, um, to, the certified to, to see who's certified, um, you can go to the website and look for um, who's Charter certified companies. Yeah, and who's yeah. who's who's a certified um, American Society of, of um, Arborists, and, and plug in your zip code, and they can tell you who's certified in your area. But that will, but being a certified arborist, I think this is important to mention, does not license you to do 
these applications. Right. You 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 want to go to the Department of Agriculture and Regulatory Services and look up uh, uh, chartered companies and make sure that the people who are doing your application are chartered and licensed and insured to do these applications uh, to make sure that you're not going to be you know that that they can cover themselves if something goes wrong and that they also have the knowledge and training to to do these correctly. So there's a and, lot to this. And I think that's important um, whether you're certified, you know, as an arborist or to apply chemicals um, that you make sure that who you hire is is trained and has right. um, insurance. That, 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 that's correct. Yes, yes. Well, um, it, you know, it's uh, uh, a, the uh, certified arborist is an international uh, certification. Uh, the uh, HLT is your state as your state right. license that 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 uh, enables you to do these applications. The being a certified arborist does not enable you to do these. these so applications. that's the International Society of Arboriculture, I say. Mm -hmm. OK, well, thank you, Matthew. I appreciate you being here for the Metro Tree Advisory Committee Tree Talk. And OK, thank you for having me. Yeah, your wealth of information. And please note that we do have a um, webinar we also do on the Emerald Ash Borer. We answer all the questions about how you can manage your ash trees and why that's important. And um, check us out for next month's tree talk as well. Thank you and have a great day.